Hello and welcome back. Come sit for a spell and join me around the cauldron for this sometimes rambly, sometimes educational podcast hosted by me, Megan, an everyday modern witch. Today's episode was inspired by the ever-changing path of the witch, or at least my ever-changing path. Don't worry, I'm not going anywhere, but I just wanted to talk a bit about finding your path, changing your mind, and making choices along the way. Oh, and if some of this information is a review for you, feel free to use the timestamps in the description and show notes to skip around. That's okay with me. I want to give a shout out to my Cauldron Collectors, those that have joined my membership to help support my work. Thank you so much for your support. If you'd like to join me as a Cauldron Collector, you can find the link in the description or the show notes, or you can go to roundthecauldron.com. Members get exclusive guided meditations, spells, and first access to most of my content. They also get special access to hidden categories in my forum for deeper conversation, divination requests, and more. So again, thank you to everyone that has joined me there for as little as $2 a month. First off, I have to say you might hear some background noise. I have animals in my office and I can't move them. So um, with that out of the way, let's talk about my personal journey. I've been a witch for most of my life at this point. I had moments where I dropped the craft, but those moments don't make me any less of a witch. I found witchcraft through Wicca in my early teens during a time in my life when I felt so out of control. Most young people, teenagers especially, have trouble fitting in and finding their place in the world. On top of all of that, I was dealing with severe mental health issues and some repressed memories that decided to resurface. Not to mention the bullying that happens to the weird kid in middle school. Over the years, I dove into Wicca headfirst as a place to find home, to find comfort. Wicca was my solace, the one thing that I had that gave me back my power. I did as much as I could do in the early 2000s. I had books and the brand new World Wide Web. I devoured every single piece of information I could get my hands on. I memorized the Wiccan read. I memorized the charge of the goddess. I had color correspondences, moon phases, and the Sabbaths all memorized. But as a young teen with Christian parents that didn't understand, I was left with all knowledge and no experience. Fast forward many years and through many ups and downs in my beliefs, I was out of my parents' house and still reading the same information. I had no guidance no real way to move forward. I knew what I believed, but I still didn't have a way to practice. I was embarrassed to explain my beliefs to my boyfriend at the time, who, by the way, is still my current partner and the father of my child. But so I kept everything hidden. In hindsight, that wasn't necessary. He doesn't care what I believe or practice as long as I'm a good person. I remember hiding my book, The Craft, by Dorothy Morrison, with a journal tucked away as I was studying. He found it, of course, because I'm not very good at hiding things, and said he didn't care what I believed and that I didn't need to hide things from him. So, now my beliefs were out in the open. And keep in mind, this was at least 10 years ago. I was Wiccan until about 2019 or 2020. Honestly, I didn't have much else to go on when it came to beliefs and alternative religions out there. I didn't know that paganism was such a large umbrella, that there was a difference between paganism and polytheism, and that I would have find a home elsewhere once I found these other paths. It's not like the books that I was reading explained the difference between Wicca and paganism. They didn't explain that there were so many different paths out there that I could choose from. This is a problem with beginner books, because most of them cater to Wicca, because that's easily consumable for the masses. And it was definitely a problem for me as I was trying to grow and find myself in my path and in my faith. After Wicca, I explored Hellenic polytheism and the Greek pantheon. Those deities will always have a special place in my heart, not because I worshipped or worked with them, but because they're some of the first deities I learned about in some form of detail. So, cheers to the Greek gods. I started my podcast in 2018, I believe, and at the time, I was still Wiccan. 
I started the podcast in the hopes of getting good information out there about Wicca in podcast form because I hadn't come across any myself. It was Joanna DeVoe that got me interested in podcasting. I listened to her podcast, Hippie Witch, uh, now known as The Joe DeVoe Show, and thought it sounded like something fun I can do. And you know, here we are in 2023, and the podcast is still going strong. I've taken breaks, of course, but this is something I look forward to doing every month. There have been times when I have done interviews, there have been times when I have just spoken from the heart without any real notes. And the podcast has been an outlet for me and a gateway to learn more about many different practices and paths that are out there in the world. I don't tend to do interviews anymore. Interviews make me very nervous and I am dealing with a lot of social anxiety, so I don't tend to do interviews. But I'm always open and able to speak from the heart and talk about things that are important to me or talk about things that are on my mind at the time. Anyway, I learned about Celtic Reconstructionism through Twitter, honestly, and once I learned of it, I was pulled in that direction. And when I I say pulled, I mean pulled, not a gentle tug, but a yank on the rope of my beliefs. I went searching for everything I could find, and I'm still constantly searching. But I have found a home here in Celtic paganism for the last three years. I've mainly worked with Bridget, though I have given offerings and asked for help from at least two other Irish deities. The Irish deities are held in high regard for me, though I've always been interested in other Celtic deities. So that's my path. But what about yours? I'm sure I skipped a few steps in my story for the sake of time, and maybe one day I'll tell the whole thing if I can remember. Finding your path can be intimidating. There are so many options, so many directions you can go. How do you know which one is right? Well, you don't. And I think that's beautiful. You may have an idea of what you believe, but aren't sure what to call it. You might have a tiny inkling of beliefs about deities, spirits, reincarnation, and the afterlife. But maybe you haven't put it all together yet. That's okay too. And maybe you already know what you believe and where your path is right now. But you know that paths can change converge, grow, shrink, and transform in many different ways. You won't know if the path is right for you until you explore it and learn about it in some way. There are a lot of words out there to describe different types of beliefs, and I'm sure I'll miss a few. Some of these are newer words, meaning I only learned about them in the last few years, while others are words that have been around for a long time. There are also so many different cultural beliefs pantheons, and folkloric beliefs that I wouldn't possibly be able to name them all in one episode. Finding your path means you have to first know that many paths are available to you. I never would have found a different path if my friend didn't show me that book back when I discovered Wicca. I never would have found Celtic polytheism if I didn't follow a variety of accounts on Twitter. I never would have understood the difference between hoodoo, voodoo, santeria, and other closed cultural practices without first being exposed to them in some way. So in order to find your path, you have to find the map that tells you where you can go. Theism is the belief that a higher power or powers exist. No matter what your beliefs are about gods, you will be theistic unless you're an atheist. Atheism is a lack of belief or a strong disbelief in the existence of a god or gods. Atheists don't believe in a higher power and many of the atheists I have met have been strongly anti-theistic. Then you have the middle ground. My partner's beliefs exist in the middle ground with agnosticism. This is the view that any deity or higher power is unknowable, and they may or may not exist. Agnosticism is sort of the shoulder shrug of theism, in my opinion. The eh, maybe of religious beliefs. Outside of those main terms, there are a few more terms that will come in handy when talking about our beliefs. These are monotheism, duotheism, pantheism, polytheism, henotheism, and animism. The last one, animism, is a belief that isn't tied directly to a religion or theistic belief system. You can be a monotheistic animist, I'm sure. 
So according to the dictionary, animism is the attribution of conscious life to objects in and phenomena of nature or to inanimate objects. That's a really long way of saying that nature and inanimate objects can and do possess their own spirit or energy, sometimes even conscious life. An animist may refer to natural landforms and other aspects of nature as having personhood. One really good explanation of animism is in the book Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend that you do. If you get the chance, listen to the audiobook because it's narrated by the author and it brings so much more to the book. It's wonderful. Anyway, in the book, Robin Wall Kimmerer talks about an interaction she had with some of her grad students when they were out on a hike. They were discussing how our language toward the world around us affects our worldview. This is from the chapter called Learning the Grammar of Animacy, and I'd like to share it with you to help you understand what animism is. The quote goes like this. One afternoon, I sat with my field ecology students by a wikwagama and shared this idea of animate language. One young man, Andy, splashing his feet in the clear water, asked the big question. Wait a second, he said, as he wrapped his mind around this linguistic distinction. Doesn't this mean that speaking English, thinking in English, somehow gives us permission to disrespect nature? By denying everyone else the right to be persons? Wouldn't things be different if nothing was an it? Swept away with the idea, he said it felt like an awakening to him. More like a remembering, I think. The animacy of the world is something we already know, but the language of animacy teeters on extinction, not just for native peoples, but for everyone. Our toddlers speak of plants and animals as if they were people, extending to themselves and intention and compassion, until we teach them not to. We quickly retrain them and make them forget. When we tell them that the tree is not a who, but an it, we make that maple an object. We put a barrier between us, absolving ourselves of moral responsibility and opening the door to exploitation. Saying it makes a living land into natural resources. If a maple is an it, we can take up the chainsaw. If a maple is a her, we think twice. Another student countered Andy's argument, but we can't say he or she. That would be anthropomorphism. They're well-schooled biologists who have been instructed, in no uncertain terms, never to ascribe human characteristics to a study object, to another species. It's a cardinal sin that leads to a loss of objectivity. Carla pointed out that it's also disrespectful to the animals. We shouldn't project our perceptions onto them. They have their own ways. They're not just people in furry costumes. Andy countered, but just because we don't think of them as humans doesn't mean they aren't beings. Isn't it even more disrespectful to assume that we're the only species that counts as persons? The arrogance of English is that the only way to be animate, to be worthy of respect and moral concern, is to be a human. While the chapter itself discusses how limited English is when it comes to the grammar of animacy, I hope the little section I shared gives you an idea of what it means to be an animist. And animism isn't something that's a closed practice. It's a belief system without spirits, gods, and higher powers. It's a worldview rather than a religion. Monotheism is one that many of us are familiar with. This is the belief that there is only one god. This is the category of theism that Christianity falls into. There is but one god. Duotheism is the belief that there are only two gods. Some Wiccan traditions may fall into this category with the way they view god and goddess. Pantheism has a few different definitions. One is the belief in and worship of all gods, no matter the religion. The other definition of pantheism is a bit more accurate, and also a bit more confusing to me, because I don't see the world this way. Wikipedia says that pantheism is the view that everything is part of an all-encompassing, imminent god. To pantheists, the universe and god are one and the same. Paganism is often called an umbrella term for many different religions. The dictionary gives us two definitions. One is that paganism is a religion other than one of the main world religions, specifically a non-Christian or pre-Christian religion. 
The second is that paganism is a modern religious movement incorporating beliefs or practices from outside the main world religions, especially nature worship. Polytheism is the belief in or worship of more than one god. Usually, this is where many pagans fall with their beliefs. I further break polytheism down into two more categories, hard and soft. I did an entire video on the difference between the two, so I will link that in the description and in the show notes. For a quick recap though, soft polytheism is the belief that all deities are a facet of one higher power or energy. Hard polytheism is the belief that each deity is their own entity and not part of a higher power. I've personally gone back and forth between these two for many years, not really sure where I stand. I know what I've experienced, but I still have unanswered questions, so maybe I'll figure it out one day. Henotheism is one I don't see mentioned very often, so I will briefly mention it here. This is the worship of one god without denying the existence of other gods. I think many pagans and polytheists may also be henotheistic. This may even apply to me right now, since I mainly work with one deity while not denying the existence of others. So that's all well and good, right? We have all of our theistic definitions out of the way, but that only scratches the surface of different paths. Don't worry, I have more information for you too. Maybe you know where you fall on the theistic spectrum, maybe you don't. That's okay. Let's explore the different paths you might have open to you, and maybe one will pique your interest. Wicca is the most well-known path in paganism. Most people are aware of Wicca, at least by the name. Actually, most people probably came into paganism through Wicca, as that's the form of paganism that's been sort of mass-produced, for lack of a better term. There are two different types of Wicca, Neo-Wicca and Traditional Wicca. Traditional Wicca is an initiatory religion, while Neo-Wicca is based on the outer circle information that's been published by other Wiccans. Traditional Wiccan information, the things you learn after being initiated, is oath-bound and not for the uninitiated. Neo-Wicca is open to everyone that wants to practice because it's not an initiatory religion. There are varying traditions within Wicca that have different beliefs. Some Wiccan covens are based on strict duotheism, worshipping the Lord and the Lady, a male and female divine figure. Others are more fluid in the deities they worship, and still others ignore the male divinity entirely and strictly focus on female divinity. Most Wiccans I've come across also practice some form of magic, but not all Wiccans do. Some Wiccans only cast spells during ritual, and others don't cast spells at all. That choice is entirely up to them and their coven. Celtic pagans are pagans that work with or worship one or more of the deities from a Celtic pantheon. If you're not familiar, the word Celtic doesn't refer to a region, but a language. The Celtic countries include, but aren't limited to, Ireland, both Northern and the Republic of Ireland, Scotland, the Isle of Man, and Wales. Some Celtic pagans may choose to worship or work with Celtic deities from many different countries. Others may choose to work with deities from one country only. I've gone back and forth between calling myself a Celtic pagan and an Irish pagan, just for specificity's sake. I kept getting questions about what paganism is like in Ireland, though, so I stopped saying Irish pagan and just started using Celtic pagan. Anyway, I have also done research on a few other Celtic deities, including Rhiannon, Epona, and Crenanos. The main deity I work with is Brigid, though I've also felt a call to Lu, Mananon MacLear, and Oma. Norse pagans are pagans that work with or worship the Norse deities. I'm not too familiar with much of Norse paganism other than the fact that there are many names and branches. There's heathenism, Asatru, and probably more that I can't name. These pagans may work with deities such as Odin, Hel, Loki, and Freya. If you'd like more information on Norse paganism, I recommend subscribing to Benta, the Norse witch, on YouTube. I'll leave their links in the description and the show notes. Hellenic pagans are pagans that work with or worship the Greek deities. This can be the Olympians, lesser gods, and other Greek entities. In my experience, the Greek deities tend to be the easiest to find information on, at least here in the United States. No one bats an eye at someone who says they're interested in Greek mythology. There's also a difference I have found between Hellenic paganism and Hellenismos. I believe that's how you say it. 
If I'm not mistaken, Hellenismos is someone that is seeking to recreate the religion and rituals of the ancient Greeks. Hellenic pagans may or may not work based on the way the ancients practiced. If you're looking for more information on Greek paganism, I recommend Fell the Blythe on YouTube. Again, I'll leave their links in the description and the show notes. Druidry is a combination of Celtic paganism and nature-based worship. The Druids generally believe in a symbiotic and peaceful relationship between humans and all beings on Earth, both seen and unseen. They may work with or worship many different Celtic deities, including those from Ireland, Wales, and Brittany. There are several modern Druid organizations in the world today, including Obod, the Order of Bards, Ovates, and Druids, and Anriacht, Anriacht Fain. I think I'm saying that right. ANF. I will leave both of those links in the description. Eclectic paganism is a sort of amalgamation of multiple types of paganism. An eclectic pagan may worship or work with deities or beings from many different pantheons, blending them together in a way that works for them and their beliefs. Generally, as long as the cultural context of the deities involved is taken into consideration and no misappropriation is happening, this is okay. There are probably so many more different varieties of paganism out there. I couldn't possibly name every single one in a single podcast episode. I could probably talk more about each one individually in the future, if that's something everyone would be interested in. Remember that these branches of paganism barely scratch the surface of the beliefs that are out there. Choose one that calls to you, one that piques your interest, and start there. The first step is always the hardest, but it's the most important one you'll make. Many other steps come after that, including changing your mind, forks in the road, taking a break, and even turning back around. Speaking of those other steps, let's talk about what happens when you need to change your mind. Sometimes changing your mind is easy. Maybe you were presented with new information that made you rethink your beliefs. Maybe something in your personal life blipped and you needed to pick a different direction. And sometimes changing your mind is hard. Sometimes it involves a tower moment where everything comes down around you because your beliefs weren't authentic. They weren't built on stable ground. Sometimes it involves realizing a deity isn't right for you, or a belief doesn't actually fit your thoughts. Sometimes it involves letting go of labels and identities that we've been holding on to for years. It's okay to change your mind when things change in your life. I believe that our beliefs are fluid. They will ebb and flow like the rivers that carve grooves into the land. When this happens, our first instinct can be to freak out. It can be instinct to resist the change, even if it's something I want. But let me tell you something. I can only think of one reason why changing your mind would be a bad idea, and that involves making oaths with deities or other entities that are much more powerful than you. An oath is a serious thing, taken seriously by gods and humans alike. If you've made an oath, you should do your best to keep that oath. I mean, if you no longer believe in the deity or spirit you've made an oath to, then keeping an oath would be a strange thing to do. But do that at your own risk. That's complicated. All other options, all other times you may need to change your mind, do it. Close up any loose ends you have, figure out your new path, and change the things that aren't working for you. And if life gives you too many lemons and things become overwhelming, it's okay to pause. It's okay to not do full rituals. It's okay to limit your offerings. It's okay if all you do is say a small prayer or even sit in stillness and take three deep breaths. I've been there. Everyone has been there. And if they haven't, well, that's good for them then. I am a firm believer that the gods understand our humanity, no matter their culture or reference. We are humans. We are mortal blips on the grand timeline of existence. Our lives can be difficult. They can be full of tragedy, trauma, poverty, and so many other things that have a dramatic effect on our lives. While the gods watch from wherever they are, I know that they understand that we can't be all about them all the time. Sometimes we have to pause so we can get our bearings. 
taking a break from any practice to make sure that your life is safe in whatever way that means for you is perfectly okay. The only thing I would say again is to make sure that you're still honoring any oaths that you've made or renegotiate them so you can take the break you need. But why would you need to take a break in the first place? Well, that's different for every person. I always like to bring it back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If your basic needs aren't taken care of, then you can't move up the pyramid, right? So basic needs are what we need to stay alive. These are our physiological needs. They include food, air, water, and shelter. Every step up the pyramid includes more things that we as humans may need. The next step, for example, is safety needs. This is a place to live, a job, resources needed for your life, and your health. The further up the pyramid you are in life, the easier it will be to make space and time for deities and religion. Now that's not to say that you can't be at the very bottom of the pyramid and have no space for religion. Everyone's different. But the types of activities you can participate in with no food are very different than what you may have energy for if you're well off and well taken care of. All that to say that it's okay to pause your path if necessary. Things don't have to be linear. And often, progress isn't linear at all. Progress often looks like a random ball of yarn that my cat got a hold of. Sometimes you'll need to take a break so you can figure out your next step, too. This is where the forks in the road come in. Sometimes one path isn't a straight line. There will be deviations, turns, crossroads, and choices that you have to make. Sometimes these will drastically change your path. Others, there may only be a slight difference. When I made the decision to leave Wicca for Celtic paganism, it wasn't an easy one. Neo-Wicca is what I knew. I didn't have a coven and wasn't initiated, but it was home. It was comforting. It was scary to choose the path at the crossroads that had more uncertainty. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know the first thing about Celtic paganism. At that time, I didn't even know that Celtic meant many different countries, not just one singular pantheon. It was intimidating to choose the path of least knowledge for me, especially as an adult that would have to relearn everything about the deities I was being presented with. But I can tell you that it was one of the best choices that I made. We may often be presented with many different forks in the road, many different paths that can take us in many different directions. We won't always know which one is the right one to go, but as long as you're following your heart, following where your spirit is leading you, then I don't think the decision is wrong. And it can be scary. It can definitely be intimidating to choose a path that you know nothing about, to choose a path that has many different gods looking down on you instead of just one or two. But if you follow that path and it turns out to be not the greatest idea, then you can just turn back around. Unlike other options in life, it's okay to go backward on your path. I actually recommend it sometimes because you never know what you missed the first time. Going back to basics of witchcraft, for example, is something that can be very helpful to even the most experienced witch. But if you've made a choice, if you took the path on the left instead of the path in the middle, and you're regretting that choice, guess what? It's okay to go backward. If you decide that the path you've chosen isn't actually working or what you wanted, it's okay to go back to what you knew. That's the beautiful thing about choosing your own path. You get to decide which direction you go in. One of the last decisions I want to talk about is whether or not you walk your path alone. Some paths are going to be better suited for the solitary practitioner. Other paths may work better practice with others. Each option has pros and cons. For example, I prefer to practice alone. I have very specific ways of doing things, and I don't like it when others interfere in my rituals or prayers. I have routines that I follow, prayers that I say, and different days that I honor. It's hard for me to see myself practicing in ritual with another person. I'd have to really trust that person to let them into my practice like that. And honestly, it's intimidating and scary to open yourself up and practice ritual or your religion in front of another person. Maybe that's just a pagan thing. I don't often see Christians talking about how scary it is to be in prayer with another Christian. Ritual is an intimate experience, and sometimes it's hard to let other people into that intimacy. We may be scared that we're going to do something wrong, 
or do something that's perceived as wrong. We may be scared that the other person doesn't understand what we're doing and we might not have the words to explain it. A lot of my practice is directly from the heart. I don't have a lot of my practice written down. Like I said, I would have to really trust someone in order to let them into my ritual space. Now that doesn't mean I wouldn't practice ritual with a group of people as long as it wasn't my ritual, if that makes sense. Group ritual is something that's a little different. Group ritual is usually something that is put together for the specific group that's attending. Everyone has a job, everyone has a focus, and everyone usually agrees on what's going to happen. That I think I would be okay with. It's been a very, very long time since I've been in a situation like that, but maybe I will have to get together with a group of friends and have a full moon ritual. Maybe we'll even go to the beach. (laughs) I think that would be really fun. I've never had a full moon ritual at the beach. I've never had a ritual at the beach to begin with. I think plans are forming. Anyway, I do enjoy having community. Having like-minded people to share thoughts and ideas with, to bounce questions off of and vet sources, that's a vital resource to have. Plus, it's nice to have friends that won't look at you like you've lost your marbles when you start talking about the way the candle wax melted in the light of the full moon as you recited your prayers. (laughs) Having pagan and witchy friends is important, in my opinion. As with everything else, my path is different than yours. These are just a few things you may want to keep in mind as you either start walking the pagan path or if you've been here for a while. Sometimes it's good to get these reminders, and I even have to remind myself. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've gone back and forth with myself in debate of soft polytheism and hard polytheism. Some days, I feel like each deity is a separate being. Other days, I have trouble wrapping my head around every culture, country, and people having a different deity. This is especially true when some of the deities are so similar that it's hard to tell them apart unless you know what you're looking for. But as long as you're walking your path in authenticity, you've got nothing to worry about. I know that was a lot of information in what seems like a very short time. I know a lot of this information may have been review for some of you that are listening. It might be new information for others. It might even be overwhelming to think of all of the different paths that you can take. But truth be told, these paths are always open to you. The paths don't have gates that close, unless a deity decides to tell you no. Take your time, go slow, do your research, listen to your intuition, and follow the path that's calling to your own heart. It's not going to steer you wrong. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe learned a thing or two, or at least stuck around for my ramblings. Um, Before we leave today, let's go ahead and pull our tarot card for the month of June. Yeah, we've already reached the halfway mark of 2023, so let's see what the cards have to say. Um, I'm actually pulling from my Oracle deck, not my tarot cards. I'm using the Spirits and Shadows Oracle deck. I'll leave a link in the description to my walkthrough of that and also where you can get it. So let's go ahead and give it a shuffle and see what card I pull. All right, for the month of June, we are keeping in mind the journey. Oh my goodness. The journey. That's exactly what this episode has been about. Where are you going? What path are you going to take? Are you ready to change your path? Are you ready to move on to bigger and better things for you? Keep these things in mind in the month of June. Maybe see where your path has diverged, where things have changed for you. Maybe make it a journal assignment. Start from the beginning. Where did you start? How did you get here? What twists and turns did you take to end up where you are right now? Through that exercise, you may end up seeing that things have changed a lot more than you realized. Enjoy the journey. That's the whole reason that we do this. It's not about the destination. It's about what we do along the way. If you'd like to see this Pacific card, Be sure to follow me on Instagram where I will post a picture of it as well as the little reading that I did for today for the month of June. Be sure to follow me on social media wherever you have it. Uh, Facebook, I'm Round the Cauldron. Instagram, I am 
round underscore the underscore cauldron. I have recently started posting on Pinterest again. Subscribe to my newsletter if you'd like to be notified of any of my new content. That includes videos, podcasts, blog posts, printables, and whatever else I decide to do. Join my forum. I have left Discord. Discord is now officially closed. Discord was too overwhelming for me. It was a lot to handle, and I know I'm not the only person that is overwhelmed by Discord. It often felt like um, I couldn't jump into conversations or start conversations if other conversations were already happening. A lot like doing a lot of talking, but then nobody's listening to you, if that makes sense. So I now have a forum that is open to everyone. You can find that at roundthecauldron.discourse.group or go to the link in the description and the show notes. It is open to everyone. If you join me as a cauldron collector, you get access to a few exclusive categories, including Monday message, divination, where you can ask for a reading and other little categories for a closer conversation. So all of the links will be in the description and the show notes. I hope you have a wonderful month of June. Please remember to enjoy the journey. Leave a review for the podcast wherever you listen so that other people can find it. Share it with your friends and your witchy groups or wherever you want to share it. Follow me on social media and I will talk to you soon. Bye.